Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Jay Walker's group have a camp out, 110 degrees. I think your name for your group is pretty good. Jay Walker's. But those of you who know me know that I did a lot of burning in my life anyway. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Jim. I uh, got sober on February 18th, 2002. Central's my home group. And it's a, it's a real honor to be asked to speak. I don't care where it is or when it is. Uh, when Alcoholics Anonymous asks me something, I say yes, because you all saved my life. This is kind of cool because I can see the fire and I can't see anybody else out there. So I don't know if there's one or 50 and I've got a full moon coming up. I think this is great. I need more talks like this. I, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. The book says that we generally talk about what we were like, what happened, what we're like now. I've got uh, kind of a three-part scenario on on what it was like. Um but the biggest part is that uh, today I've got a God in my life that I never had. And every day that God gets stronger and gets better and helps me get through more things than I ever dreamed I would ever get through. I came from a military family, uh, an Air Force family. My dad was what I consider a hero. He said he was just doing his job. Um, but he, uh, he flew the first B-17 over Berlin and um, re-upped for World War II, did it twice. Uh, he flew 34 missions. He was the first C-49 into Korea, did two tours there, and then he was the oldest forward air controller off of Monkey Mountain in Vietnam. I always like to say that he didn't like to be around the house very much. He thought the war was better than my mom. But, uh, you know, we moved around a lot, and that's what military families did back then. I was born on April 1st in 1954. And some of you are old enough to know that there's a song called Thunder Road about a moonshiner, and the day the moonshiner died was on the 1st of April, 1954. So, you know, God put me in the world, I guess, to take over for the moonshiner's son. I uh, I moved all over, like I said. Every couple of years we were moving. The longest I can remember us uh, in one place was in Yokota, Japan. And uh, when I uh, when I finally got sober, and I didn't get sober when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous to quit drinking. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But when I finally did get sober and I had to do uh, my fourth step in my inventory, and then I had to share my entire life, because that's what the book says. And I'm going to use the book a lot in my talk, because it's really important for me to stick to the guidelines and the directions as outlined in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. They have not changed that in 73 years, 74 years. There's got to be something working in that book if they won't change any of the words. And it worked in my life, and it's working every day in thousands and millions of other people's lives. Like I said, we moved all over the world. Um, Japan, we were about three and a half years. We moved to Tacoma, Washington. Uh, in Tacoma, Washington, because I was already, and I, I realize this now, I was already on the road to alcoholism. I already had all the flavors of alcoholism, I could say that, because I was a liar, a cheater, and a thief at 10 years old. Uh, We were coming home from school, three of us were coming home from school one day, and we caught this little field mouse, and we were playing with it, and no big deal, we were kids. I liked the woods, I still like the woods, and one of the kids got bit on the finger, just a little nip, but, you know, for some reason we kept that mouse, and he took it home in his little lunchbox, and his mom, of course, now I understand it, his mom got all panicked about it and called my mom. And my mom came in and said, did you get bit by that mouse? And I was thinking at the time, I don't have to go to school. I never liked school. I'm not one of the school people that love school. I hated it. And uh, she came in and said, did you get bit? And I said, absolutely. I didn't say absolutely. I said, yes, ma'am. And the next thing I know is I'm getting rabies shots. I didn't get to get out of school. I had to go to the base dispensary, get a rabies shot every morning. Um, because in 1962, I'm pretty sure it was 62, 
Uh, they didn't have health departments where you could find out if a rat had rabies right away. They had to send it off to Washington, D.C. So by the time we knew it didn't have rabies, I had 11 shots. And those, those of you who know about rabies shots, you only get 14 of them, and you have rabies the rest of your life, I think, as I had it and I still have it. Um, but that was just because I was a liar, you know. And that was really, I had already had consequences before that because of my lying. But that's one that I can really remember the most painful thing in my life until I got some liver problems was those rabies shots. Now, the next year, uh, we moved to Duluth, Minnesota, which I always say if you have a chance to go there, pass. It's the coldest place on the earth. It's colder than Alaska sometimes. Right now, I think it's about minus 20 degrees in Duluth. In Orlando, it's 110 degrees. Stand by the fire, it's 150 degrees. But, you know, you don't get to pick where you get to stay in sometimes. So anyway, I, uh, my oldest sister got married. And because she got married, there was a big reception. And I was 11 years old, and everybody, the colonel said everybody could toast my sister with the champagne that comes out of the fountain. So we all got a glass, and we were standing around, and everybody was you know, toasted my sister, and then they were going to sip the champagne. And I didn't sip mine. I just guzzled it right back. And something happened. You know, I'm 11 years old, and something happened that I can't explain other than it set off something in me that didn't get put out until I was 44 years old. And then I didn't get sober until I was 47 years old. But it put out something. It, it lit a fire in me, as I like to say, that that wanted more. Um, that night I went back by that champagne fountain and got another four or five more of those until I was good and hammered and drunk. And they put me to sleep, they put me to bed, I spun around, I threw up, I peed on myself. And I didn't know that 25 years later that would become a habit for me. You know, spinning out of control, blacking out, waking up with puke and pee all over me. But that was the end of my uh, my illustrious career, career in drinking. I uh, I moved down here, the family moved down here a couple years later when Dad went to Nam. It was 1966, and I started hanging around with people uh, about four years older than me, guys that were about four years older than me, and they liked to do what I liked to do. They liked to drink. And so every chance I could, I was skipping school or I was skipping out at night when Mom went to sleep, and I was getting with these guys, and we were getting good and, good and plastered. I can tell you right now that because of the time frame, the late 60s, early 70s, when I really had the peak of my first part of drinking, I had a lot of outside influence, a lot of other substances, because that's what was around at the time. But I heard a girl say the other night at a newcomer meeting that, you know, she's not going to talk about non-conference approved substances. And I thought that was pretty cool the way she said that, non-conference approved substances. Because I love the traditions, and the tradition five, which talks about our group has but one primary purpose, and that's to carry the message, its message, and my group's message is Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I'm not going to sit there and bore you with all the drugs I did. I can tell you I did every drug that was ever manufactured and every one that was illegal except crack cocaine. I had quit doing those outside flavors before I got to that, and I can tell you by talking to people who've done that, I'm very glad. I may not have made it in if I had gotten that one, but I uh, I spent the better part of my youth running away because I was in trouble all the time. Consequences didn't matter. What mattered was me getting alcohol. And so I went to the juvenile home until I was 16. From 16 to 17 and a half, I was uh, doing burglaries all the time. Um, I burglared every place around town, houses, businesses, cars, whatever I could do to steal your stuff, so I could sell it and get my booze. I wasn't interested in working. I wasn't interested in going to school. I was interested in getting drunk. And uh, you would think that, you know, you go to the juvenile home enough times, you don't like being in a little square room. Um, and that never, you know, there was a consequence every time I, I got caught. I didn't get caught every time I drank, but every time I got caught, I'd been drinking. And it didn't matter. You know, there's something wired with me that was different than normal people. It didn't matter. And so when I got out of the juvenile stage and I became a junior adult, as they call it, 
I started getting put in jail. And I started going to jail on a regular basis. Um, I stopped being just a burglar because I saw there was money if I picked up a gun and I became an armed robber. 16, 17, and 18, uh, that's what I was doing. Now, all these times I was going to jail and going to the juvenile home, whenever my dad would come back in town, he would come and he would talk with the authorities and he would say, all right, I'm, I'm back here now, we're going to bail him out, and I would behave for a while. When my dad did things with me, go camping, go hunting, go fishing, I would behave. I was a pretty good kid. But the minute he went on temporary duty somewhere, or he went over to Nam, or he went anywhere else, I had three older sisters, I had an older brother, and I had a younger brother. And they, the older, the older family members, they all wanted to do good. And I didn't want to do good. I wanted to do what Jim wanted to do. And uh, it wasn't until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous that I didn't know that, that I found out that Jim had been selfish and self-centered all his life before he ever had alcohol. I had those tendencies to do things because I wanted to and I didn't care, you know, really didn't care what the consequences were. I, um, I got out of jail when I was 17 on a $7,500 bail. My dad put it up. And he pretty much didn't want to. It was the, the last time this was going to happen. Um, but I begged him. I, I did what I called today the alcoholic plea. You know, I promise I'll never do it again. You know, and he had heard, heard that for years. <laughs> but he did it one more time. And that night he went to sleep with my mom. I broke into his gun case. I took the 45 automatic he carried through three wars. I went out the back door, I went over the wall, and I took off for California. And I'm 17 years old. And all the way to California, I'm on a, uh, a run, um, paying for everything with that gun and, and stupidity, I call it now, but that's what I was doing. I got to California, and due to those outside influences, and I will, because it's an open meeting, there's a couple parts where I've got to talk about it. Um, the guys that were with me dumped me out of the car in front of a... Uh, a military base hospital because I turned orange. I had a serum hepatitis, and uh, I had it to uh, such a uh, such a degree that they didn't know if I was going to live or die. And I was in isolation in that hospital for about six to eight weeks while they were trying to uh, get food and liquids into me. And somehow, you know, I look back now and I'll tell you that it was God always in my life. Whether I was acknowledging him or not, God was there. Um, my family was not a religious family. We didn't go to church. A couple times a year, we'd get dressed up for the base and, and show up at church. But I didn't have a God in my life. I didn't have a concept of God in my life until I came into AA. I got out of that hospital. And I'm wanted in Florida, and I'm not even thinking about that. I go across the states again. I wind up in Minnesota. Uh, I'm doing all kinds of illegal things, still using a gun to get my money. And they're having a party in Maitland, and some friends, you know, knew where I were, was and invited me back, and I thought I'd sneak into Florida for a couple days, sneak back out. I got caught at the party by uh, by Orange County, Winter Park, and Maitland uh, vice squad. They knew I was coming. And when they raided that house, I had just done a bunch of phenocyclidine along with drinking a lot of cheap whiskey, phenocyclidine, for those of you who don't know it, is PCP, and it's also called animal tranquilizer. So I was pretty crazy when they came in the house, and I pointed my gun at the guy coming up the stairs, and he was pointing his gun at me, yelling, drop it, drop it. And, you know, it just seemed like a long time went by before I finally put my gun down. That man's name was Butch Doyle. Um, he recently retired as the chief of Maitland Police Department. His name's Ed Doyle. And I've made amends to that man, too, because he should have shot me. And today, if you ask him, he'll tell you he doesn't know why he didn't. He should have shot me. He would, he would tell you that today. I got taken back to jail, and I had serum hepatitis again. Now, this is the second time in a year that I'm dying from liver disease. And I usually forget it by the end of this this talk, that uh, something miraculous happened when I got sober. 
something really miraculous happened was that, A, I got sober through God's grace. I didn't get sober on my own, and you all didn't get me sober. But I also became an EMT, and they weren't bringing any kind of meetings into the uh, chain gang, and that's where I wound up, by the way, is I wound up in a chain gang when I was, I turned 18 years old, and two months later, I got sentenced to 52 years in a state penitentiary. And uh, right after that, the judge called me back a couple weeks later and said that I had some redeeming qualities. He was going to sentence me to 18 months in the Orange County chain gang, and that's where 33rd Street is right now. But I'm going to jump forward real quick because I'll forget about it. In Third Step Prayer, when it talks about Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. I never asked God to remove my hepatitis. I had it for all my life. I wasn't allowed to give blood, and I wasn't allowed to give bone marrow uh, platelets for my sister when she was dying from a bone marrow disease. And when I got sober with a GED from a chain gang that I carry around with me, I didn't pass any subjects with anything higher than a 58. I uh, I went to Valencia because my son challenged me to become an EMT. And I took the course, and I say God took the test because I passed the test. And when they were giving me the uh, the blood things that I was going to have to have, they said, you need to have the A and B vaccine. And I went to my doctor, and he said, you don't need those vaccines. You've had hepatitis all your life. You don't, you don't need to get those, but we're going to have some blood tests for you. Uh, we haven't had any for about five years. And when the blood test came back, my doctor used to be the medical examiner for Orange Osceola in Seminole County. And he called me in and he said, as a medical professional, I can't explain this to you, but you've got no enzymes in your liver of hepatitis at all. And he says, I know you go to that AA. I've been sober about a year. And he said, whatever you're doing, keep going there because, like I said, as a medical professional, I can't tell you how that happened. And I can tell you, I had blood tests about six months ago, and I still don't have any enzymes from hepatitis. And I thought I was going to die of liver disease back in 17 and 18 years old. When I was in the chain gang, and if you've seen the movie Cool Hand Luke, that's as close as I can describe it. Um, they didn't have chains around our legs, but they had guards at each end. And uh, sun up to sundown, six days a week, you got in the back of a, a screened-in truck, and you got in the ditch with a swing blade. And people see work release people out there now, I always say, with weed eaters and blowers, and that's not what we had in 1972. You you had what they call a Kaiser blade or a sickle. And, I mean, it was all day. And in Florida in July, I just came out of isolation in Orange County Jail with hepatitis again. It was murder. I mean, it was murder. When people talk about how hard their work is, or I got guys who say, you know, these steps are hard. And I look at them and go, let me tell you about hard. You know, climbing a ditch, staying there all day, ask somebody, moving it up, boss, shaking it down, boss, going to the bathroom, boss. That was that was humiliating, and I didn't care. All I cared about is what can I do to get out of this ditch and get in that kitchen? Because, you see, at the time we were feeding 150 people three meals a day. There was none of those buildings out at 33rd Street that are out there now. There was one square concrete building and a bunch of pasture land where we raised our own cows, hogs, grew our own vegetables. And in the kitchen, you have enough ingredients that you can put them in a can. I used to tell you what was the ingredients, and I stopped doing that. But I can assure you, yeast, sugar, syrup, and a few other things, you let it sit for a couple of weeks on a top shelf where somebody doesn't see it, and you can drink that, and you can get the effects produced by alcohol. It's the nastiest horrible stuff that you could ever drink in your life. So whoever tells me you drank the nastiest stuff, I'm going to ask you, did you put rotten grapefruit in it to make it as the filler? Because that's what we used out at the chain gang, and I can tell you, it was horrible, but it gave me the effect produced by alcohol. And so for the last six months of my term out there, I was in the kitchen, and I was making booze as long as I could until I finally got caught doing that. But I was... uh I was gracious with a little Italian guard who told me to get rid of it the time I got caught at the end, and I did, and we drank it, and uh, uh, he said get rid of it. He didn't say how. Um, I got out of there when I was uh, almost 19 years old, 
I did go to school while I was in there, and like I said, I carry around a GED that says below 70 is failing, and my highest score was a history score of 59. And, you know, it's amazing to me today to look at the bottom of that thing and say, it says graduated, 1973. And how do you graduate with a 59? Um, you know, that's God. It's got to be God. I got out of there, and like I said, you know, I, I, I really felt like those consequences were enough for me. Um, I did not stop stealing. I did not stop breaking in. I stopped getting caught. But a couple of years later, I had gone through that first phase of my life. I, I call it my days of rage. I was about 23 years old, and I got rid of all those extra substances other than a couple of them, but alcohol. You know, alcohol was the first thing I drank. Alcohol was the last thing I drank. And it almost killed me. I met a girl in Mississippi um, while I was drinking pretty heavily uh, when I was 26 years old. She was 18. When I was 24, i got to get this right now. I was 24. She was 18. I met her. Our first date, we got drunk. We got in bed. Um, we fell in love. Um, starts with the same letters, has the same amount of letters in it. Is lust, you know, and I know that today, but, you know, she stayed with me 21 years. And I was, you know, I was a drunk, but I was what I call a functional drunk because I was the manager of a pizza hut. Um, I always had a good job. I always got up and went to work. But at night, when I was done working, I got drunk. When I was 26, my father and I reconciled and I got into the real estate business. And a lot of the miracles are going back and having to find and fill out your record and find out all the places you were arrested and all the things you were charged with and then write letters saying how you're a changed person. And I was. I wasn't doing drugs. You know, alcohol was okay. I could get drunk at night. I could black out. I could do stupid things. But I wasn't going out to the bar anymore because I was married. And I was staying at home. And we were, you know, we were fine. She put up with that drinking for an awful long time. Um, and God bless her for that. You know, the, the amends that I had to make to my ex-wife were twofold. Um, the first amends I made when I was in AA, but I wasn't sober, uh, I went from the first part of step one to the ninth step, and I called her drunk to make amends. And that didn't go over real well. And then when I got sober and I had to make real amends, that was kind of hard for her to really believe that, that was happening. And I can tell you, you know, 11 years later, whether she thinks I'm sober tonight or not, doesn't really matter. Uh, I did my job. I did not, you know, I cleaned up my part of the street. I'm bouncing all around the place, and, and that's the only way I can tell you how much God's been in my life. Because I look back, and I remember so much more today than I remembered a month ago or a week ago. And every time I remember what I did and what I went through, you know, there's no there's no possible way for me to be standing here. I shouldn't be alive. I, I definitely shouldn't be sober if I was alive. And it's all because of my God. It's all because I found that power that everybody was talking about when I came through the doors in 1998. I uh, I kept drinking. Somebody, when it's 10 minutes to raise your hand, will you? Because I can't see. I kept drinking um, real heavy. And the time came when we were married about 20 years. Uh, we had a little boy. He was four years old at the time. Some of you have met him. His name's Forrest. He is my pride and joy. That little boy has grown up in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. He's 18 years old now. He stands taller than me. And he's never had a drink or done a drug. And he's done 12-step work on his friends. And that is just unbelievable. But that's what happens. That's what happens when when you're such a drunk that I was, that my ex-wife gave me an ultimatum. You get sober or I'm going to take your son away. And I chose to stay in the bottle. And when my son was five years old, he was moved out to Mississippi and he's been raised by a really nice man for the past 13 years. Uh, and I've, I've made amends to my ex-wife, but I really made amends to that man because, you know, he's not an alcoholic. He's a really nice guy. 
and he's done a really good job instilling values and and all the things that were instilled in me that I rejected because of alcohol. And my son has those things. But more than anything, he has them because you instilled them in him. Uh, you'd come to meetings and you'd see him sitting by the coffee bar. And, you know, he'd come to things like a camp out like this. But we didn't have camp outs. Central has picnics. And I was about three years sober and he was staying with me for the summer and we went to a picnic and there was 300 people at the VFW and we had it open to everybody and there was just people everywhere running around. And, you know, everybody was coming by saying, hey, Jim, hey, Jim. And on the way home, he looked at me and he goes, you know, Dad, you've got a lot of friends. And I went, wow, you're absolutely right. I do. You know, that same year, he said to me one time, he's coming home from day camp, and he said, how was your meeting today? And I said, it was a really good meeting. He goes, I can't wait till I grow up and I go to those meetings. You know, eight years old, and I'm thinking, my God, I hope you don't ever have to go. You know, I said that so fast, and he goes, why? I said, well, tell me why. And he says, well, you tell me all the time that you go there, you don't drink, you talk about God, and you help other people. Sounds like a neat place. You know, eight years old, out of the mouth of babes. He he loves you all. He loves my friends when we go bowling. He tells me sometimes on the way home, he'll look at me and say, you have got some weird friends. (laughs) And I'm like, you are so right. (laughs) But we had a great time tonight. And we did. You know, we we bowl, we camp out, we go, you know, canoeing. We go, we do all kinds of things I would have sworn to you couldn't happen without alcohol. And I've had the greatest time in my life being sober. I didn't get sober right away. When I came to Central, I came to try to save a marriage. Most of us know that if we don't come in and we haven't hit that place yet, we probably aren't going to stay. And I came in and out. Um, it's kind of funny because my uh, real estate office is right there on Colonial Drive, almost kitty corner to Central. There used to be a little house on the corner, and I'd go to work early every morning. Um, my head would be throbbing, I'd be drunk from the night before, and there were so many times that I went to work in the morning drunk from the night before, but because I wasn't drinking, you know, I thought I was sober. But I know if I got pulled over at 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning, I would have been, I, I could have been very easily arrested. I used to drive by Central every morning and go to the office, and I would look over there and I'd say, what a strange place for a labor pool. <laughs> Because everybody's outside smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and there's all these people that look like you need to be in a labor pool. I guess the ones that were dressed up were still inside. I don't know. But, you know, I asked somebody, I said, you know, my wife's going to leave me. I, I, I might have a problem with alcohol. I'm, I'm not waking up in the middle of the night, and I'm going to the bathroom, and she doesn't appreciate it. Um and she didn't appreciate it, and she moved to another room, and I continued not to wake up in the middle of the night going to the bathroom, and I finally said, maybe I got something going on with my body, you know, maybe it's that hepatitis, and I came to Central because a friend of mine committed suicide, and he'd been in and out of the program. I'd heard at that time, I was 44 years old, I'd heard about Alcoholics Anonymous, but my parents never talked about it. They never talked about both of their fathers dying from alcoholism. I had met one grandfather and saw the way he treated my grandmother, and I thought that was horrible, but I didn't stay there very long. But they didn't talk about their youth. They never talked about alcoholism. They never talked about AA. And so it just went over my head. I never knew I had a problem, you know, until the time came that I was going to lose my child. And then I decided I was going to come to AA and tell you all about my friend who committed suicide, uh, right up in Volusia County, he set his car on fire um, and burned himself to death. And it was horrible. It was horrible. And for some reason, I went to his funeral and I felt, I felt the hand of God. And I didn't know anything about God. I just felt something at that funeral. And my life was out of control. And my son was going to be taken away. And I came to Central and I came in there and burst out in tears at a noon meeting. And I said, if you drunks don't quit drinking... You're going to kill yourself. Now, some of you might not might not know how stupid that sounds when you walk in, and there's people with 30 years of sobriety, and they're looking over at me, going, 
Good Lord, this one's going to take some time. <laughs> and it took me three and a half years. Uh, there was an older gentleman. Most of you don't know him, but he was an older gentleman named Leo. And he was a survivor of the concentration camps in Germany. He was uh, taken in 1939 to the Auschwitz concentration camp. I never pronounce it right. And he was made to clean out the gas chambers for five years. And he cleaned out 22 of his own family members along with tens of thousands of other people. And so he saw the horror of horrors. And I felt to myself, if there's anybody who ever had a right to be an alcoholic, it was Leo. And he had 27 years of uninterrupted sobriety the day I walked in. And I came to a meeting every day, and I said, I can't stop drinking. And people would tell me, what, what you hear today in the room was no different in 1998. Not at all. Get a sponsor, work the steps, ask God to keep you away from that first drink. It's that first drink that gets you drunk. I heard that, and I thought that guy was a wimp. You know, how could he get drunk on the first drink? I, I say today, if people had explained some of these catchy phrases a little bit more, AA is going to screw up your drinking. I was like, yeah, you go to AA, you stop drinking. No, it's when you start drinking after you've been to AA. It's a pretty sad sight, and you know it because I did it. I continued to do it. I got so old mad at that old man for telling me to drink a bottle of arsenic that after 27 days of coming to a meeting every day and saying I can't quit drinking, for the first time in almost 35 years, I didn't drink any alcohol, and I didn't do anything else. And that was a Friday night, and I came in that Saturday, and I picked up a white chip. And I tell you that I started my sobriety on a resentment. And anybody who starts their sobriety on a resentment, I can tell you today, they're not going to stay sober. And I didn't. Every couple of months, three months, six months, I would decide that everything's going good. I'm feeling better. My job's better. I got a little money. I can take a drink. And, you know, nowadays we pass around phone numbers for people to call. Well, that didn't happen when I came into Central. People got my phone number. And there was one girl that absolutely drove me crazy. You know, I wouldn't show up for four or five days. And this girl named Julie J would be on my answering machine all night long. Hey, Jim, we're kind of worried about you. We hope you're okay. I hope you're alive. We miss you. And I'm like, Geez, I mean, she's the one who told me AA's going to screw up your drinking, and she did. <laughs> you know? And her husband's here tonight, you know? <clears throat> and uh, God bless Julie. She was the first person to ever touch me and say, it's going to be all right. You know, I'm in tears. I've given away my son. My life's in a shamble. And I keep drinking. And then I got it. I mean, I, I got it as far as a non-sober alcoholic can get it. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to keep me away from a drink. I'm going to go to a meeting every day. And I'm going to ask God in the afternoon not to let me drink. And things are going to be okay. And they were. They were great. I went nine months going to a meeting every day, not drinking, praying in the morning to some God that I had no clue about. And I got pretty pretty good at lying in AA. You know, you'd come up and say, you got a sponsor, Jim? I sure do. Absolutely. You work in the steps? I sure am. And, and it got to be bad where I'd have to remember that Katie asked me yesterday about the, you know, what step are you on? And I told her the fourth step, so I'd have to be on the fourth step tomorrow. But I'd say the ninth step, and I was really on the third step, and then yesterday I was on the twelfth step, and, you know, I was sponsoring myself. I did not have a sponsor. All I had was the grace of God that was keeping me away from a drink one day at a time. But I wasn't doing anything else. And the book is very, very clear about that. That there will come a time in everybody's life where there's no power that's going to keep you away from a drink. No human power could have relieved me of my alcoholism. <clears throat> and that day came when I went to Central. And it's kind of funny because... Uh, Last Saturday night, it was a Saturday night exactly 11 years ago when I picked up a nine-month chip. I wasn't lying about that. I wasn't drinking and going to meetings. I wasn't drinking in between meetings. I just wasn't working the steps, and I didn't have a sponsor. 
But I really was not drinking any alcohol, and I wasn't doing any other things. And I picked up a, a, a chip at a speaker meeting, and a guy named Joe S. was speaking. And the power of his talk on that night was unbelievable. For me, it was unbelievable because he was speaking to me. And I was nodding and bobbing my head. And the guy who brought me to that meeting was sitting next to me, and he decided it was time that I went ahead and found a sponsor. And uh, he introduced me to Joe that night. And God was standing right there. Because as all these people are standing around Joe, he looks at me and says, Are you done drinking? And I said, Yeah, I am sure I'm done drinking. I haven't had a drink in nine months. I don't want to drink. And I took out my business card, and on the back side, on the white side, I wrote down my phone number. I handed it to Joe, and I said, Call me Monday if you want to sponsor me. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, he took out his business card, and on the back side, on the white side, he wrote down his phone number and said, Jim, call me Monday if you want me to sponsor you. And we turned over those two business cards, and we worked for the same real estate company in two different cities. I had never met the man before in my life. He worked in Winter Park. I worked in Orlando. He worked in housing. I worked in commercial. We had never crossed paths. But I knew right then that there was a God in my life. And he was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And the next morning I went to a 10 o'clock meeting just like this past Sunday. It was a Sunday morning. I went to a 10 o'clock meeting and I was feeling great. And that afternoon, there was no effective mental defense against that drink. I kept saying that I couldn't do all those steps because the second step talks about me being insane. Because if I'm going to be restored to sanity, that means I have to be insane to begin with. And that Sunday afternoon, I stopped and I said, I'm going to have one drink tonight and prove that I'm different. I'm going to prove that I can drink. And I bought a half gallon of whiskey because I'm going to have one drink. Nothing's crossing my mind. Nothing's telling me how insane this is. Nothing's telling me I need to pick up the phone and call somebody. I've decided I'm going to have one drink. And maybe in a couple of years, I'll have another one, so I might as well buy a big bottle. You don't want to have to go there twice. You don't want to have to go there twice, right? I remember taking that drink on Sunday night, just about 6 o'clock. And I don't remember anything else. Until the next morning, at about 8 o'clock in the morning, when I was face down on my kitchen floor and I was covered in puke, I was covered in pee, and I was covered in blood. And I was panicked. I was in so much fear of what I had done. And I didn't know what I had done. I didn't know who I had hurt. And it took about 15 minutes sitting there looking at half of that bottle gone. And then finally realizing it was my blood. I had hit my head on the kitchen table going down. And I'd been there laying all night long in a puddle of blood and puke. And I know people today that we bury from my home group that had the exact same thing happen to them. I did the right thing finally. I knew what was going to happen. And so I called Joe. And probably the only time in 11 years that Joe has answered the phone <laughs> for me. You know, maybe he's answered it for other people, but he answered the phone that morning and I told him what I did. And he said, pour the rest of your booze down the drain, go to Central at noon, pick up a white chip, and I'll meet you. And we're going to start working these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what happened 11 years ago on Monday. This guy gave up <clears throat> his time and his effort to take a hopeless, helpless drunk like me through this program. And he didn't make things up. He told me what he had done, and he told me what it said in the book. And I've had two other sponsors since then. I've got one now, a guy who stands about 4 feet 9, came from Scotland, and he's the same way. If it's not in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, he doesn't have anything for me other than prayer. Because I'll ask him, what should I do about this? And almost always it's prayer. You know, but studying the book is what he told me. Study a textbook called Alcoholics Anonymous and find out what this book means in your life. And it means everything to me today. It means everything when I take somebody through the book and then they call me and say, what should I do about this girl? And I'm like, 
Let me look in the book. I don't know. <laughs> it says right there in the book, I don't know. Only God knows. Only God's going to judge your sex conduct. I don't have an opinion. I'm not hysterical. And I got no advice. But I'm telling you, if you do what it says in the book, you'll find the girl. You know, same thing about a job. Same thing about anything. The book tells me that if I find that power, if I tap into that power greater than myself, that all my problems can be solved by that power. Not just my drink problem. All my problems. And I found that's been the case. And the biggest case is that I'm selfish and self-centered to the extreme. When I'm drinking, I don't care about you. When I'm sober, I care about you. When I'm working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm wanting to help you. And there's the difference. I cannot drink and care about you, but I'm not going to spend any time with you. Or I can work that 12 step into my life on a daily basis, and when somebody comes in and reaches out for help, there's an obligation, there's a responsibility for me, and that's to reach my hand back. The Miracles of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, that book was written in 39. It says, the age of miracles are upon us. Well, here it's 2013, and the age of miracles is still upon me every day. I was on the way out here today. I called my sponsor. He lives down in Davenport. And I said, you know, the horrible things that happened to me last year. I lost somebody very close to me in a relationship. I went bankrupt and went from pay, getting paid $95 an hour to advise you on your real estate to getting paid $10 an hour to pick weeds. Those things happened because God wanted me to find some humility. So in that humility, I also found a group of men that were going through the basics of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was invited to join them. And we started on the first page, and we read it line by line. And we would stop every time one of us would have something to say. You know, I knew a couple of the people in there. Most of them I didn't. And so hearing it from a new perspective, looking at the entire book and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous from a different angle, like I did in my fourth step, looking at it from an entirely different angle, opened my eyes so much that I can look back now and tell you that I was supposed to be in that big book study at that time to prepare me for what I had to find in November. Now, in November four years ago, my little brother, who was 10 years younger than me, I was holding his hands in Florida Hospital when he took his last breath. And he died from alcoholism at 44 years old. Almost four years to the day, in Georgia, on November 10th, I found my older, older brother dead. And he had been dead up there for three or four days by himself. And he died from untreated alcoholism. He hadn't drank for 20 years because he was like the guy in the book that quit drinking to save his job, and he was able to put the booze down, not drink, get a real nice retirement, move up there with me to Georgia. I moved back when my little brother died because I fell in love, and I'm still in love. Don't get me wrong, folks. I'm in love in a different way today. I'm growing. God's got me growing every day. But when I found my older brother up there dead, I was horrified. Now, I'm an EMT. I've seen dead people. I've seen dead people for weeks. But when it's your own brother. You know, you just sit there, and it's just horrible. And the only thing I could think about doing was the exact same thing I'd done four years before, is pick up the phone and call a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I called five or six of y'all, and five or six of y'all called other people who gave them my phone number, and for the next two and a half, three days that I was up there, I was talking to alcoholics day and night. And when I called my sponsor tonight on the way out here, I said, you know what? I'm done grieving. Because there's a fine line I've found between self-pity and sorrow. And so I have, I have grieved my older brother. I'll grieve the rest of my life, don't get me wrong. But I'll talk about it. And I won't have to break out and cry, I don't think. I don't have to be self-pity anymore. Because I found... That's where I was going. How could I be second-guessing God and his plan for my older brother? 
my older brother had been hurting and in severe medical problem for years that I was unaware of until he died. When the coroner called his doctor and we found out all the medical conditions he had, it's a wonder he lived the five years he lived up there in Georgia after he retired. Why should I question God who took my little brother away? Because he was full of tumors because of alcoholism. He was in extreme pain. He could barely walk without a whole bunch of medications in him. And there's a heavy-duty heroin-based medications. Why am I going to question God taking both of them out of their pain? Because Jim feels bad. How self-centered is that? And I didn't realize it until today on the way out here. You know, that's what my God does for me. He keeps opening up these little things inside of me that says, here, Jim, this is why. And I don't ask God why. I have a friend who talks about why is a management question. And when I took step one, absolutely took step one, I admitted to my innermost self that I was alcoholic, that any delusion that I had was smashed that I knew I wasn't like normal people. That's the first step of recovery. That's the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was powerless over alcohol, and I'm not the manager of my life. God's the manager of my life. And why is a management question? And today I'm told I'm not in management. I'm in labor. I'm supposed to be carrying the message. i damn sure not supposed to be carrying the mess anymore, because that's what I did for a long time. I, uh, I learn things every day. Because of that 11 step. Because I, I maintain a conscious contact with God. The book tells me that upon awakening, I need to ask God for the right thought or direction for the day. I used to think it meant after I get up and pee, make some coffee, have a cigarette, maybe think about going and telling God, you know, hey, can you help me out today? So now it's when I open my eyes. It's when I wake up. I tell God, thank you. It's your day, not mine. My days are over. You know, I killed my days, and now it's your day, God. Keep me away from a drink or a drug, and don't let me hurt anybody today. Let me do something that helps you. I don't know that I'm helping God ever, but I know if I'm not hurting you, and I'm not hurting me by drinking, then I've got a pretty good shot at this world. And I got a pretty good shot that today's going to be a pretty good day. I really didn't know that. I didn't know that when I first got sober. All I knew was to do what it says in the book. And I had a problem with that pause when agitated. I don't know about anybody else. My sponsor told me that pause when agitated is also on your computer. It's not called reply and it's not called sin. It's called save or delete. So the first year when I was trying to do this program, I would get an email from my ex-wife. When I was drinking, I had an all reply and sin. And now I have pause, save, save to draft, and then delete. Because I don't need to respond. I don't need to buy into any kind of argument or fight. I've learned that I have six forms of communication because I had to learn how to communicate again. I didn't know how to communicate my way or the highway. That was that was my communications. And I found that I have six ways to communicate. I can talk, we can have a conversation, or we can have a discussion. Now, after those three, I need to stop because the next three are after the discussion. I'm going to be in a debate. Then I'm going to get in a argument, and then I'm going to get in a fight. And the book tells me that I've resigned from the debating society, and when that is number four in my communication list, I need to stop at discussion. I don't need to be right every time because I thought I, I needed to be right. I love being right. I love being happy and right. They don't always go together, but I do love it, but I don't have to be right. You know, the book even tells us they don't have a monopoly on getting sober and having a great life. It says so right there in a vision for you. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. God will constantly disclose more 
to you and our fellows, to me and you. And he does. Now, I didn't have detox. I didn't have rehab. I didn't have treatment. I didn't have the emergency room. I had drinking, and then I had Alcoholics Anonymous. So I don't know about 90 meetings in 90 days. I don't know just keep coming back at work. All I know is follow the directions in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and Jim's life is much better than if Jim tried to run his life and not follow those directions. Because those directions lead me to a power greater than myself who I call God. And it's been that way. And it stays that way today. I'm a big fan of the traditions and I'll tell you that right now. If you're not into the traditions, get into them. We're not here. This meeting is not taking place unless those 12 traditions got put together. We were chewing our legs off back in the early 40s with so many rules, regulations, haves, have-nots, must, you know, requirements. The word requirement and the word rule is used in the doctor's opinion. Now, there is some requirements that are in the book Alcoholics Anonymous in the pages 1 through 164. But the doctor, who was not an alcoholic, was the one who said the only, the only requirement necessary is to follow a few simple rules. You know, if you told me there were rules when I got here, I'd have left. But Bill saw there was rules back in the early 40s, and he started writing these traditions. And one of the traditions saved our life, and that's tradition 3. There are no rules. Rule 62 I saw in somebody's campsite a minute ago. There's only one requirement. That's a desire to quit drinking. You don't even have to quit drinking. You just have to have a desire to quit drinking. And you know, one of the last talks that Bill Wilson gave, he said that these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are not something that we just work one time. They're something that we live in our daily lives. And we're supposed to carry this into all our affairs, not just when I'm in a meeting. And so what I use as a, a guidepost today for me, and I heard it at the state convention, it's not so much what I'm doing between the serenity prayer and the Lord's prayer. What am I doing between the Lord's prayer and the serenity prayer? I hope I'm doing what y'all taught me. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.